Marx's theory of the determination of profit rates. I'm going to introduce the theory of this and I'm going to compare that with what happened in the late 19th century to the British profit rate with detailed statistical evidence. And I'm going to argue that the 19th century evidence is broadly consistent with the mathematical model in Marx's Capital. The lecture is based on an article shortly to appear in Research and Political Economy and the full set of statistics will probably take two videos. So here goes. Now the concept of a falling rate of profit wasn't invented by Marx. Predecessors like Smith and Ricardo also had such a theory. Smith's theory, in its simple form, was that accumulation leads to an increase in competition between capitals and hence a driving down of the profit rate. Though a more careful reading of Smith might indicate that he actually had some idea of an organic composition of capital. Ricardo believed that competition only distributed the in, only influenced the distribution of capital between profits, not the overall amount. And his theory was that it was the rising share of the surplus going to landlords that drove down the rate of return. And this came about because an increasing population led to increasingly marginal land being cultivated on which the landlords were able to charge a higher rent. Marx's theory is in a sense more akin to Smith's, at least insofar as it had nothing to do with diminishing returns. And I'll get into details of it probably in the second uh, lecture. I'm going to give the overall introduction that Marx gives in this lecture. There are two basic arguments that Marx gives in Capital. One, which first appears in Capital One in his notebooks of the 1860s and in Capital Three, is to the effect that the rate of profit must fall due to an increase in the organic composition of capital. An increase which is itself seen as due to the search for maximum profit on the part of capitalists. There's a second account by Marx which is in terms of the overproduction of capital and later on I'll give a calculus model of that or at least in the paper I give a calculus model of that and show that it leads to very accurate uh, predictions. Now I'm going to start with the simple numerical example that Mark gives in Capital 3, Chapter 13. And in this, he assumes that the level of wages and the working day are fixed. Now, one justification for that is that when economists are trying to examine the effect of one factor they hold other things constant but there is more to it than that he says that under these circumstances a given sum of money being paid in wages each work each week can stand as an index for the number of workers employed thus if the wage is one pound per week 100 pounds represents a workforce of a hundred people. Now this is an important point. He's not just using a uh, ceteris paribus here. He is using it as a statistical index for the number of workers employed. The assumptions are made to enable him to use money wages and money expenditure on means of production as proxies, or as he puts it, indices for the real underlying relationship between living and dead labour. That is what is, the, to him, the causal factor 
it's the ratio of living to dead labour that is the real cause of a rate of profit. And the monetary quantities are just the phenomenal form in which this becomes apparent to the capitalist accountant. The second video in this series will show that over the period Marx was writing about, these money quantities were in fact a good approximation for the living to dead ra labour ratio. Now, what does he mean by living ratio? Well, living to dead ra labour ratio. Here's a train with a driver and a fireman. They are carrying out living labour. They're human beings. They're what Marx calls variable capital when they're employed by a capitalist. On the other hand, they're using dead labour, the locomotive, and that locomotive was built and workers had to build it and labour went into building it, but that labour is dead. It occurred in the past and is now being utilised by living labour. In the example, Marx assumes a rate of surplus value of 100%. That is to say, value is divided equally between labour and capital. So taking the £100 that he was talking about before, total value created per week is £200. And he uses the formula uh, S over V, surplus over variable, which is profit over wages, uh, is 100% here. And sometimes uses the, the, the symbol S prime to indicate it. This rate of surplus value could, however, he says, express itself in very different rates of profit, depending on the total amount of capital employed. So workers could be exploited the same amount, but different capitalists under different circumstances would see a different rate of profit. And he presents this table here. Um, the variables are C is the constant capital or means of production, the engine in that picture. Wages are V and he's taking wages as an index of the number of workers. The total capital he counts as the sum of wages plus the constant capital. And the rate of profit is the hundred pounds created by the hundred workers divided by the total capital. And therefore, he says the rate of profit can vary enormously. And it does. Here it says starts off 67% in the top example, where C was only 50. But in another example, where there's a much larger C, the rate of profit has fallen to 20%. And what he's assuming is that V is an index of the number of workers, and that the surplus is proportional to the number of workers. Whereas there's no such constraint on the constant capital. As the ratio of C over V rises, the rate of profit falls. And since these are indices for dead to living labour, this implies that the more dead labour there is, the lower the rate of profit will be. The more the mass of machinery is, the lower the rate of profit will be. That was the, the, the description Marx gives of it. Now, we shouldn't overinterpret this. There's nothing here that explicitly depends on time. It could just as easily be shown, used to show that industries with a high C over V must experience a lower rate of profit. So the rows in his table here, the rows in this table might indicate different industries earning different rates of profit. And that is in fact what we see. If you look at any capitalist country, you'll find that if you plot C over V along the x-axis and the surplus over the rate of profit S over C on the other axis, there's a downward slope. So the higher the C over V, the lower the rate of profit. 
in Marx's example, the variation was at roughly three to one uh, in the rate of return capital stock. These data taken from the British economy show a variation of closer to 100 to 1 in the, the return on capital stock. And there is a huge variation in C over V. Again, a variation of the order of 100 to 1. Or even more, in fact. Um, it looks more like 1,000 to 1, uh, the C over V ratio. But as Marx's table predicts, the rate of return is inversely related to C over V. Marx says, very large undertakings, such as railways on the other hand, which have an unusually high proportion of constant capital, do not yield the average rate of profit, but only a portion of it, only an interest. So he is stating that in the 19th century, railways, which had a high organic composition of capital, had a low rate of profit. That's an observation. A factual observation he's, he's recounting. This observation by Marx fits what we now know to be the general rule. That the higher the organic composition of capital, or industries of very high organic composition of capital, out here have low rates of profit. Those with very low organic compositions of capital have a higher rate of profit. This is the strongest support for Marx's labour theory of value, this empirical observation. The inverse relationship between C over V only makes sense if, as Marx claimed, labour is a source of value. Why else should this relationship exist? And it's a robust relationship. Now let's add the time dimension. What I was showing there is roughly, those were on my graph as a log scale there. If you plot it on a non-log scale, you see a curve like that roughly for the profit rates. Um, and you have railways at the one end with very high organic composition of capital, and you have the sweated trades uh, that Marx describes in Volume 1 of Capital, which have a high rate of profit. Now, how would the rate of profit change as time went on? So here's a third dimension. We had two dimensions to start off. Industry versus profit rate. What happens if, if you introduce time? Would the rates of profit rise, fall, or would they stay the same over the period of time? Now, Marx's account is very influenced by what had just been going on during his lifetime, which was the railway boom. This is a scene from the opening of, I think, the Manchester to Liverpool railway or some similar railway. There was a huge boom in the 1840s in railway investment in England. Shortly after that, there was a similar boom in the United States. I'm taking a graph from the book Boom and Bust by Quinn and Turner here. The solid dark line here is the share of gross national product that was going into capital accumulation in the railways. And you can see that in the mid-1840s, it was peaking at around 6% of GDP was being invested in railways. And that, of course, meant that the capital stock rose. And the dotted line is the capital stock invested in railways. So it starts out very low in hundreds of millions, or in millions, and rises by the 1870s to 160 million. Now, of course, a pound was worth a lot more in those days. So 160 million was a huge sum of money. Now, what effect did this rise in C, in constant capital, have on the profitability of railways? 
Well, the railway profits absolutely tanked. The um, red line is the market index of the railways, their stock value. The blue line is the dividends that they paid. So the rate of return, the profits of the railways declined and in consequence the nominal capital valuation of the railways fell. Now, it's very important to realise that the nominal capital valuation of the railways on the stock market is quite different from the real value of capital that had been invested. When the rate of return falls, and falls below the rate of interest, the shares are marked down because a capitalist seeking to invest in that would think I'll sell my shares and put the money in the bank and I can get a better rate of return. So that when the rate of actual rate of profit on real capital falls below the rate of interest, then the, sh the value of the shares declines. And this is from The Railway Mania, Not Such Great Expectations by Gareth Campbell. This is the declining rate of profit. The declining rate of profit becoming evident in the 1840s over time. The rise in capital intensity in the railways in the 1840s drove down the rate of profit for the industry. And as a result, the general rate of profit in the economy fell somewhat. And this all happened at the time Marx was starting his study of political economy. And it clearly influences thinking. That's why he specifically quotes railways as getting no more than the rate of interest. Why do they get no more than... Why don't they end up with less than the rate of interest? Is because the shares can't fall below the rate of interest significantly. Because they'll keep on falling until the nominal value of the share is the same as the rate of interest. And what Marx expected was that successive waves of new technology, like the railways, would boost capital intensity and in the long run they would reduce the, the rate of return. I'm going to look at the actual evidence um, for what happened from the time he wrote Capital to the end of the 19th century in my next lecture. Okay, more about that in the next video.